So hello, everyone, um, and welcome. Uh, I'm David Solo, and happy to uh, be your host for this event. Uh, we're very excited today to share the results of 10 by 10's inaugural program of grants on photo book history. Um, on the housekeeping front, this event is being recorded, uh, and all the participants will be muted throughout, but you are welcome to engage via the chat window. 10 by 10 Photo Books is a nonprofit organization with the mission to foster engagement with the global photo book community through an appreciation, dissemination, and understanding of photo books. We offer an ongoing multi-platform series of public photo book events, including reading rooms, salons, publications, online communities, and partnerships with arts organizations and institutions. You can see more about us at 10x10photobooks.org. Over its first decade or so, 10 by 10 has done a number of projects exploring and presenting elements of photo book history. And our most recent publication project is What They Saw, Historical Photo Books by Women, 1843 to 1999. The first reading room associated with that took place in May at the New York Public Library. And there are several more to come in the US and internationally. And again, you can uh, follow 10 by 10 and, and find out more information as the details of those get confirmed. In the spring of 2021, 10 by 10 initiated a new program to award grants focusing on research and scholarship that seeks to fill gaps and provide missing information in the history of the photo book. The theme expanded on what they saw and elicited a wide range of excellent proposals. From those submissions, we selected the three grantees who will be sharing their work today. We'd like to gratefully thank the jurors for that first round, Dr. Susan Bright, Ingrid Masando and Sarah Meister for their participation. 10 by 10's research grants for 2021 were generously underwritten by the Moose Foundation, an organization with a mission to make visible their photography collection and archives through exhibitions, scholarship, donations, licensing, and the printing of images and books. Additional support was also provided by Richard Grosbard and David Solo. We are just announcing the call for submissions for the second cycle of grants. And for this round, we encourage proposals exploring work by women in Asia, Australia, or Africa. In other words, outside of the Americas and, and Europe. We view this scope very broadly, where the subject of the research might be about artists from these continents or working there and from any time period. Details can be found shortly on the 10 by 10 website under research grants. For today's program, each of the three grantees will spend about 20 minutes sharing their results which will be followed by a short discussion amongst the presenters and then audience Q&A. Yasmin's presentation has been reported in advance, uh, but she will be participating in the discussion afterwards. Uh, please feel free to post questions in the chat window at any time, and we'll try to get to as much as we can. And so now to introduce the three grantees, and apologies in advance for what will be my inevitable pronunciation errors. Yasmin Tan is Associate Professor of Art and Design History at the Lebanese American University in Beirut. She is currently visiting professor at Bilkent University in Turkey. Her interdisciplinary research cuts across the fields of visual culture, gender politics, photography, and design history with a focus on Lebanon and the Middle East. She is the author of a number of publications, among them reading Marie El Kazan's photographs from 2020 and Salua Raouda Choker, Modern Arab Design in 2019. She's on the advisory board for the Design and Culture Journal. Faridé Merab is a Venezuelan designer currently based in New York City. She founded independent publishing house Ediciones Letra Muerta in 2014 with an emphasis on underrepresented female poets and has published over eight books to date. She is a visiting scholar at Columbia University and an instructor at the Center for Book Arts in New York. She is a member of the Board of Trustees of the American Printing History Association and has won many awards in Latin America, Europe, and the USA, including AIGA's 50 Books, 50 Book Covers in 2019. Dr. Ushi Klein is a senior lecturer and researcher at the University of Brighton in the UK with an eclectic interest in all aspects of photography her current research focuses on Romanian photography as a form of cultural resistance in communist Romania, as well as on decolonizing the Western photography canon to broaden the knowledge and perspectives by including marginalized voices. Her recent publications include a chapter in the volume, The Camera as Actor from Rutledge in 2020, 
and various articles in academic journals. And so now uh, we will begin and I will start by uh, sharing Yasmin's video and then we'll be followed up by the other two speakers. So thank you very much. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank 10 by 10 photo books organization for the research grant that supported the study of Catherine Lehua's photographs in God Cried. I am equally grateful to Fred Richen, Robert Pledge, and Dominique at the Dotation Catherine Leroy, and Tony Clifton for sharing with me a few insights on Catherine. Um, I also want to apologize for my voice. I'm going to try to do my best. I am in quarantine, uh, still recovering uh, with a cold. <clears throat> Catherine Leroy. Uh, who was born in 1944 and passed away in 2007, along with Christine uh, Spengler and Françoise de Mulder, are considered the pioneer French female war correspondences of the second part of the 20th century. In God Cried, Tony Clifton, an Australian correspondent to Newsweek magazine, relying on his sensitive and informed testimony, reports the Palestinian and the Lebanese experience that culminated in the Israeli siege to Beirut, along with Clifton's text. We see Leroy's graphic and painful photographs that narrate the agonies of science, sympathy, and rage felt by the photographer. Describing God cried, Edward Said writes, there is an urgency in the author's conviction that what he writes is unfairly matched against a public narrative skewed very much in Israel's favor, unquote. Uh, consequently, the book has been subject to an extended controversy due to its open criticism to the Israeli forces and for openly condemning the IDF for their indiscriminate bombing of Beirut. Leroy's photographs in God Cried were not about providing a biased perspective on what's happening on the ground, but more about narrating human suffering. Leroy and Naim Atallah, the publisher of the book, seem to agree that, I'm quoting Atallah here, the killing of innocent people of any race should be condemned by humanity as a whole, unquote. It is worthwhile noting here that Beirut can be considered the climax of Leroy's career as a combat photographer. While in Beirut in 1976, she became the first woman to receive the, the Robert Kappa gold medal for the coverage in time of street combat in Beirut. Leroy, a tough French freelance photographer who, can, uh, who covered the atrocities of the Vietnam War when she was 21, went to Beirut in the mid 70s, where she spent most of uh, uh, almost a decade living in, bet, uh, in between Tel Zatar, Burj el Brajne and Sabra and Shatilia, Shatila Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, taking pictures of not only Palestinian fighters and the destruction of Beirut, but also of dead bodies, injured civilians and dismembered children. God cried would have definitely been an incomplete recounting of the war in Lebanon without Leroy's photographs. A fearless combat photographer and a provocative uh, photojournalist who followed the Palestinians and the Lebanese to record their strife and daily suffering. This talk is about the way Leroy photographs uh, provide the reader with the full story a nuanced view of the situation on the ground, the way the Palestinian uh, struggle has been reported by global media sources, downplays Palestinian suffering and uses a number of strategies to prioritize Israeli's narrative, writes Habir and Najjar in Al Jazeera. <coughs> Excuse me. Media practices. Media practices that disguise Israeli war crimes using semantics and ambiguity have been repeatedly noticed in the press. The predominant image circulating in the international press construct the Palestinian as the enemy of peace, as menacing figures with kafiyas and ski masks. 
Leroy's photographs counter this common visual representation of Palestinians in the Western press. Leroy's photographs, as they appear in God Cried, provide an image of the Palestinian as ordinary human uh, beings who are vulnerable, fragile, endangered, targeted, and sometimes powerless subjects. In a series of photographs, Leroy seems to be putting herself in dangerous situations in order to make a statement that she was, she was there. Leroy was there on the roof of the Commodore Hotel in West Beirut in the summer of 1982. The place where all the journalists gather, the place where stories were exchanged about how close they were to death or to getting an interview with Arafat. Leroy here, um, uh, it seems, is more interested in the way a group of photojournalists and cameramen are looking than what they were looking at. Most appear looking through their lenses, trying to capture the best view of Israel war uh, aircraft circling around the Beirut skylight. skyline. Sorry. Uh, Le Roy was there in the middle of the gunfire battles in the streets of downtown Beirut. She was there during the intense Israeli raids on Beirut, as we can see on the, uh, the, the, the photo on the right. Looking at one of Catherine's photos brings back the sound of the airplanes raiding over Beirut, writes Clifton in the book. She made it her mission to take the viewers <laughs> indirectly into the heart of the destruction, to make them relive the moment that she and the fighters and the victims had experienced at the moment in time of the photograph. <clears throat> in the photo on the left, one might wonder how could she be so close to the scene? It is almost as if she was part of the conflict. While flipping the book, one notices a cinematic effect in the sequence and layout of the photographs that increases the sound effect of the explosions. The photo on the right that bleeds off on page 73 of the book is about time. Three traumatized men, uh, one bending uh, to protect himself, the other making a gesture with his hand to say, wait. The reader turns the page to see full bleed, uh, a full bleed page of a panoramic view of Beirut being destructed by the Israeli raids. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Leroy's photos not only capture the site of the event of the explosions, but also its deafening sound. Almost everyone uh, who appears in this photo is sticking his fingers in his ears to prevent the deafening sound of the explosions, except for the photographer. Leroy was there. She was in the middle of the street fights, not an outsider, but almost as part of the fight. On photographing Beirut during the civil war and the expectations of global press agencies, a prominent Lebanese photographer by the name Fuad al-Khouri al rec recounts an exchange with his press agency, explaining, and I'm quoting him here, I have photographed uh, such and such, but no flames, no horrible scene. Do you have images of corpse? No, I do not. Not even a few pieces of bodies? Not really. And do you have charred heads? Unfortunately, no. So you have nothing in color of hands or heads or things like that? In a war, the easiest subject to find is a bleeding corpse, writes Clifton. The real genius is to take a picture of a living person without a drop of blood showing and record the suffering in a simple, a single way, a human face. And this is what Leroy captures in these photographs uh, on the slide. Approaching a Palestinian fighter was a challenge during the war. Seeing how they were depicted in the news, the Palestinian fighters didn't trust the journalists. They avoided them. But Leroy managed to gain the Fida'i Yin trust. Fida'i means a Palestinian uh, fighter. When the Palestinians saw that they were treated like humans in Leroy's photographs, they began to trust her. 
and they gave her access to information and places that would have been impossible before the war. Leroy's photos are known for revealing the fragility of men in, in war conflict zones. She befriended the young Fidaiyin. Many of them spoke English. It was easy to communicate with them. She spent most of her time with these young and fearless fighters. She would tell her, uh, sorry, they would tell her where it was safe to go and when to go. She had been in battle alongside with them and had the scars to prove it. Photographing human subjects is a concrete social encounter. Often between a damaged, victimized and powerless individual and a relatively privileged observer, often acting as the eye of power, the agent of some social, political or journalistic institution. Leroy managed to break this conventional hierarchy of photographer and subject. This division seems to collapse in Leroy's photographs in this slide. Leroy is no longer considered an outsider. She shared their despair, she mourned their deaths and felt their pain. The Fida'i has been repeatedly depicted as the arch villain opposing peace in the Western press, whereas here, Leroy's photographs resist this narrative. The first two photographs on the left perfectly symbolize the duality of the Palestinian life and image between a refugee and a terrorist, between a victim and a victimizer. The photo evokes a strong but gentle Fida'i who has uh, agreed to be photographed by Le Roy in this way. The photo on the left is featured in the book on a full page right next to the chapter entitled True Fida'i Yin. A Fida'i is a Palestinian fighter, but what is a true Fida'i? The true Fida'i, as seen in Le Roy's photograph, is a human fighter. He is fragile, sensitive, and caring. He looks at Le Roy with soft eyes, a scarf around his head, and what seems to be the PLO emblem on his forehead. <clears throat> he is cuddling a cat who sits comfortably on his lap. The caption reads, tough cats. To add to the tension in the photograph, the true Fida'i is the fighter who strives for peace, as seen in the second photo, in which another Fida'i stands for Le Roy, legless and homeless, but still longing for a possible hope of peaceful days. He is about to free three pigeons in the sky as a sign for longing for peace. And in the third photo, it is mentioned, as mentioned, sorry, in the caption, Fatme Jabir, who at 10, according to Leroy, Leroy's notes, lost her leg on the first day of the Israeli shelling in Beirut. This is another photograph in which Le Roy evokes a harmless Palestinian who, despite being dismembered, is still capable of sharing a smile while facing her camera, uh, Le Roy's camera. Her smile is so captivating that one almost overlooks her missing arm. On that day in the news, the New York Times has censored the term indiscriminate in a journalist reporting that references the Israeli indiscriminate shelling of Beirut. <coughs> Excuse me. The photos in the slides are all evidence of the innocent civilians targeted by the Israeli bombing of hospitals, children hospitals, and mentally disabled hospitals in Beirut. The indexicality of the photographs Presenting the event as facts empowers the narrative by providing real evidence to the truth. What is disturbing in these photos is the presumption of a common referential reality, their non-fictionality and their scientificity. Leroy's photographs here explores the gap between truth and reality, history and the fabrication of it. I want people who see my pictures to hate war as I do, said Le Roy in an interview in the early 70s. So how does a photo photograph make, uh, makes the viewer hate war? 
by sending most of her time by spending most of her time at the mental hospital that was repeatedly hit and damaged with a significant number of patients during uh, turned into casualties during the Israeli raids on the refugee camps. Um, Leroy took these photographs. A friend of her, uh, Claire Constant, uh, who was a French nurse who worked with Médecins Sans Frontières, recounts that when her team established their makeshift hospital in Burj Brajni, uh, a Palestinian camp, they deliberately didn't hang the traditional Red Cross flags. Uh, and I am quoting her here. She says, because we didn't want to attract the attention of the Israeli gunners and pilots. When the siege started, there were 17 hospitals in West Beirut. By the time the fighting finished, five were closed and one had been badly damaged. This book, God Cried, contains 104 photographs. Four of them were taken by Alain Manga, Mangam, uh, uh, feature the horrifying event of the Sabra and Shatila camp massacre. Of the total 100 photographs taken by Lehua, almost half depict children, uh, and half of these, the in half of these, the children appear crippled in the photographs. These photos speak loudly of the Israeli indiscriminate shelling, targeting hospitals and innocent children during the war. And the Hua made sure to restore their humanity by adding their names and their age for each photograph. Often in the press, the name of the injured Palestinians or, or just Palestinian civilians uh, are not mentioned. When John Moore was commissioned to take photographs of Palestinians for an exhibition at the International Conference on the Question of Palestine, held by the United Nations in Geneva in 1983. The official response was that they can hang them up, but <clears throat> no captions, no legends, or any other text can be displayed along the photos. The prohibition on adding text was perhaps a way to silence the photographs. To keep disturbing images from taking on an even more disturbing voice, Le Roy is aware that adding a name, an age, a context empowers the narrative and strengthens the, indexical, uh, the indexical quality of the photo by linking it to a reference or reality or truth. With her photographs, she, Le Roy, enters the lives of others, allowing them to tell their own stories. This series of photos can be considered a photo essay that tells Fadi's story. On a number of pages in the book, Fadi's photographs occupy full spreads. The photos are laid out as in, photo, as in a photo essay. Fadi Salim is not mentioned anywhere in the text, in Clifton's text, except in the captions. <coughs> <coughs> Fadi tells his own story through Le Roy's photos that start with a close-up portrait of a young, handsome, inquisitive child holding a pen. In the next photo, <clears throat> the camera zooms out, uh, sorry, zooms in to reveal, or zooms out to reveal Fadi's missing leg. Le Roy followed him to school and then to his home. In his room, Fadi felt comfortable to share with Le Roy, and I'm quoting Fadi here, as in the caption, I was in the kitchen when the plane came. My mother yelled. I lay down on the floor covered with dust. I passed out. These last photographs in the book place, uh, placed before the Sabra and Shatila massacres are striking images with powerful meaning that I would like to discuss in uh, ending my presentation today. The one on the left is an enlarged image bleeding off a full page that shows the Palestinians leaving Beirut. Le Roy made sure to capture part of the Palestinian crescent painted in red on the bus to help the viewer locate the photograph in time and space. Both riders are blindfolded 
with injured eyes. On the next page is the photo on the right, the only photograph in which we see for the first time in God cried members of the military Israeli defense forces. On the left, the Palestinians are represented without eyes. And on the right, the Israelis commander is looking through his binocular. Read through Foucault's infamous panopticon, this photograph is a representation of power. The power of who can look and who has been denied access for looking. For Ariella Azulai, Photography opens up a dynamic visual field in which the participants, here the photographer, the photographed, and the spectators are in an open dialogue. Building on Azulai's influential theorization of the medium as a social practice that allows subjects to come together and enter into a public dialogue by means of images, I argue that Leroy's photographs are revealing I will explain further here. Rona Sella and a number of scholars have been investigating what Sella refers to as, and I'm quoting Sella here, one of the biggest acts of plunder by Israel that was of a vast Palestinian archive of photographs and films looted by Israeli military forces in Beirut in 1982, the time when Leroy Leroy took these photographs. Within the context of concealing historical facts and photographs about the Palestinian people, Leroy's photo, photographs in God Cried can be read as part of this revealing, denouncing, and restoring humanity to people who have been denied reference, history, and life. This last photo is about the ongoing surveying look of the Israeli army of Lebanon. Oh, sorry, over Lebanon. It is about the unbalanced power, the Israeli army surveillance and control of the Lebanese border, the south of Lebanon, and the movement of the Palestinian people. Thank you. Um, so as you may know, today I'm talking about Carmela Leisaola. She was the first woman to work as a graphic designer in Venezuela, and her work is deeply related to photography and the use of photomontage in the country. Uh, it's ironic to think of calling Carmele the first designer, woman designer, when she was born in 1929, and the term wasn't even in use uh, until seven years prior to her being born. So, one of the things I would first like to say, a little disclaimer, um, I don't know if you're aware, but a lot of people um, have access to some archives in different uh, libraries or different private institutions. In the case of Carmele, it has been really hard to track down her work because there are no official records of it. So most of this uh, research was built with family archives and printed publications looking at credits and colophones. So I hope that you know that although I don't know everything, I'm very open to you know receiving comments in the chat and after the presentation. And yes. So some of the reference that I think about when talking about Carmela Leisaola is that I expect when I'm reading books to find her work and it's not there. The only place that I could find her work about 10 years ago was in a Vimeo uh, micro documentary. And in these books that we see here, one of the main issues is that less than like around 10% or less are women. And although these are numbers that I'm throwing out there lightly because I would need another year to thoroughly check uh, the bibliographical references to state this, I can say that even in the Latin American photo book that we see in the middle, there are less uh, Venezuelan photo books than in, there's more Venezuelan photo books in the 10 by 10 publication than even inside of the Latin American photo book. On the right, I have two very important publications from Venezuela. And although these are 
one of my favorite books. I have to say that the most recent one is the one on the top right, and it was last published in the 90s. So it's been more than 30 years since there's a bibliography that we can consult. The book in the bottom was published in the 60s, and even then, Carmela's work was not mentioned. Uh, in Diseño Gráfico Venezuela, 70, 80, 90, this was part, published by uh, Centro de Arte de la Estancia. And even on the first section about periodicals, her work is mentioned, but in the introductory text when, working, when talking about newspapers, the importance of her legacy is totally disregarded. So this makes me think about how important it is to recognize the work not only of women, but especially of immigrants and women of color. And sometimes everything regarding photography and design for women like Carmele or women like myself, feels like someone's talking on a table and having an important discussion and we're not invited. So by proposing this work, I feel like I'm bringing my own chair to start, to start my own conversation. And the chair is not any chair, it's designed by Patricia Orquiola. So this work began, as I said, with a Vimeo video. This was made by Seminario um, de Diseño de la Información. This was a project that Carmen Riera, who I'm gonna talk about later, is also involved. And Carmela's work is relevant, not only because of the before mentioned uh, characteristics about photo montage or the aesthetics of her work per se, but also because her life and career are um, the documentation of very specific political and social conflict. So she was born in San Sebastián, Guipúzcoa. And back then they were living the consequences uh, of the Spanish Civil War. And while she migrated to Venezuela, while she was on the ship with her mom and her siblings, uh, it was announced that the Hiroshima bomb had dropped and it was the end of World War II. So these two major um, political and uh, bellic situations marked her career in ways that we will, that I will explain later on. And also in the later part of her career, the economic and social crisis in Venezuela, where is she, where is she, which is where she developed uh, most of the publications that I'm gonna be sharing. I relate to Carmela's work uh, on a very personal level, not only as a woman as, or as an immigrant, but because in the time where I graduated or I was studying, most of the things that I looked for, or I hoped for that I've seen in role models like herself, uh, I had not access to any of them because the, the, the government, the state had, had made it impossible for people like me to have access to them from simple things like having a passport or holding documents to travel, to migrate, or from the fact that most newspapers were, um, let's say silenced by the government, either by removing resources, essential resources like paper, onto more recent situations like um, blocking IP addresses of websites, having art and culture sections being distributed by uh, email threads instead of normal media. Um, even Twitter sometimes getting blocked. Um, and the most recent thing, two examples I could mention in 2019, a massive blackout, the largest blackout documented in Venezuelan history, um, in which we lost 20 years of photographic documentation that not only include Carmela's work, but also registration of protests in the country. And at the same time, this is not a coincidence because the, uh, the Cadena Capriles was acquired by someone fond of the government in 2013, I would like to say. So, um, yo voy a estar hablando un poco de español también en esta charla porque veo que en el público hay gente de mi país y quiero que muchos me puedan entender. Eh, toda la reconstrucción de esta, de esta línea cronológica fue hecha, como comenté, a través de... Eh, créditos, colofones eh, 
y una de las características principales es que la mayoría de estas publicaciones muchas veces no daban crédito a mujeres. Um, for example, Carmele in the 50s was already working at Elite Magazine. I know for a fact because looking at the magazines, I found her amongst the photos of the workers of uh, the press, but she was not credited on the actual publications. She started in Tipografía Vargas, which is one of the most important um, presses to mention in Venezuelan printing history. And her actual work began to be credited in 56. It's important to mention that although her work seems to have been until the 60s, there was a change in administration in 59. So this means that most of the records or the way the things were being kept uh, changed. So this was the official beginning of her career. And in the actual uh, printing press where she was working at Tipografía Vargas, her father was already working and he was previously a photojournalist for La Esfera, another periodical. And he arrived in Venezuela with a Leica. And I think this is important to mention because that was one of the first things that made me you know, um, apply for this grant. Uh, trying to find documentation of Carmela's photography. It turns out it was her father all along who was documenting um, sports sections for a newspaper. Her father got fired because the owners of the newspaper found out he was a communist. And back then, uh, a lot of media was divided by, um, let's say, political beliefs. <laughs> um, After this, I would say she not only got the opportunity to work at printed media, but to share spaces with people like Nedo, uh, who designed Revista Cal. Then uh, she proceeded to work at Momento Magazine in the year 57. Uh, this magazine was really important because it not only talked about subjects uh, on social um, eventos sociales, like we say in Spanish, but it also touched upon really deep subjects rooted in society at the moment, like segregation, uh, objectification, objectifying of women, and in the case specifically of Venezuela, the oil boom. So as you may know, a lot of the immigrants of Venezuela uh, fostered in the 50s came from politics uh, set by President um, Medina Angarita, who created this politics uh, for welcoming immigrants and, and for them to develop their careers in different fields. And this brought a sense of hybridity to uh, not only graphic design, but everything that was happening in the country. So oil is a huge part of the story. Then in 58, uh, there's official documentation of her working in the Acción Democrática Semanario or periodical. And this happened for two years from 58 to 60. This was right after the dictatorship of Marcos Perez Jimenez had ended. But a lot of oral sources said that she had, begin, she had began to work on uh, similar projects regarding um, activism, even during the dictatorship, you know, um, On, on the low. Uh, here you can see an influence of protest graphics. And one of the main characteristics of her publications uh, by this time is she incorporated um, crowd photographs to show uh, the rebellion of, of the people against uh, the, con the consequences or the tale or the, or the impronta of uh, the state politics from the dictatorship. Then in 1966, and I found this almost by, <laughs> by mistake because there was a huge gap from 57 to 66, from 60 to 66. And while I was doing research, I found out that during those years, she gave birth to her four children, Eneko, Xiaoming, Estivalis y Miquel. And they're all involved somehow in publishing and design and, uh, and the arts, by the way. Um, so during that time, during those years, 
uh, a lot of uh, the interviews that I made, a lot of people said that she worked during the four pregnancies, but I couldn't find any printed material supporting that. So there's something that I wish to continue, research I wish to continue pursuing. Here in the cover of Bohemia, we can see Celia Cruz, who was openly against the Cuban dictatorship, wearing a flamenco dress. So this is a cover I really like specifically because of the hybridity uh, that's implied. This was a magazine that was owned by the same group that will later hire her, La Familia Armas, from the conglomerate Bloque de Armas. So this was for a short period of time. And then from 67 to 68, she worked at Imagen Magazine. This is a very important magazine in Venezuela because it not only discusses uh, literary affairs in the country, but also arts, photography. Uh, but around this time, uh, Revista Cal, who I mentioned previously, was also really popular. So she came to find in another immigrant designer like Nedo, and back in that time, also people like Loifer or La Rijun, uh, references uh, for her work, but not only references in other printed media, but references in, in visual culture that came from the political uh, conflict climate that she was living. So here we can see examples of how she begins to incorporate the silhouetting of photographs. Um, even the logo of the magazine, uh, the fact that the G is larger, that was her idea and that continued to be implemented along the years. And here we can see a spread of Borges. The use of the grid in, in her uh, publications is very uh, noticeable. She used to create a lot of um, geometric compositions. And then from 68 to 70, there's a huge gap. And I came to find that she was uh, working in Spain. She went back to Spain with her, her children and her then husband, Luis Las Eras, an architect, and lived in Spain for two years. She worked in commercial projects. I couldn't find any documentation of those projects, but I did find the name of the press. It was called Gráficas Valverde. And I wish to continue doing research on that <laughs> after this. So some of the references I've been meaning to discuss regarding um, the political context come directly from the vanguardias, the avant-garde, uh, things like Dada uh, and um, graphic against uh, fascism. So here are two examples. For example, on the left, we see Gret Stern's work. And with one image, she managed to create an entire ambience uh, by repetition, by photomontage. And here on the, by the side of that image, we can see um, one of Carmela's headers for a newspaper where with the same image by increasing the size of the one in the back, she managed to create depth or to fill out the composition in a nicer way given the limited uh, resources. Now on the right, we see an example of a photo montage of Hannah Hogg. And by it, we see a photo montage kind of like a cadaver exquisito by Carmela Leisaola using um, different elements from different uh, photographies to create a new scene. Something really important, a, a really uh, noticeable or prominent example I would like to mention is also John Hartfield. I hope, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. So on the left, we see how these three men are silhouetted and incorporated in a flat background with graphic elements. And then Carmele, we can see her um, silhouetting in this case, uh, Marcel Marceau and creating different depths within uh, what would otherwise be a flat surface by adding lines, the use of typography, the dimension. Um, and that's something that characterized her work, the use of white space. And then here on this other side, we see a similar image, uh, but with the use of engravings. So since the system for printing at uh, Tipografía Vargas and many of these publications for many years was Hueco Grabado, which was already in, in motion in the US for many years. One of the characteristics of our country is that we got, I, won't, I wouldn't like to say the leftovers, but we got everything that people were already using for many years uh, later on. 
So we try to make the most uh, of that in different ways. Here, I drafted this little messy timeline of the different periods where she worked in El Nacional. So her time in El Nacional was sometimes credited and sometimes not credited. So from 79 to 88, I managed to find uh, her presence in credit pages, but it's divided among many sections of the newspaper, not only one. From 79 to 82, we see from left to right, uh, Cuerpo, eh? which is one of sections of the newspaper. Then in 81, we see Mujer, which is woman and Economía. Then Feriado from 82 to 88. And then the magazine Espacios Calidos uh, from the Ateneum, which got published until 87. And then from 88 to 92, although I did not find any data, uh, a lot of her co workers uh, and with the Meto de Triangulacion, I managed to uh, kind of build a timeline where she stayed in the newspaper within different sections. So one of the, one of the important facts that I found is that Cuerpo C, that I haven't documented, but you can see two images in the bottom, um, talked about women photographers like Thea Segal or Barbara Brandley, which was a huge influence uh, visually, in my opinion. And I would like to further explore Cuerpo C, but all the sections that you see here above, the five sections, I have documented in their entirety. It's around thousands of images. I don't know how many. And in her later stages in the 90s, in sus etapas, en sus últimas etapas, en los 90, el trabajo documentado, está el trabajo que hizo en Domingo Hoy. En esta época, Carmele trabajó con Carmen Riera, eh, Carmen Riera, una maravillosa periodista y diagramadora. Carmen me cuenta que en 1992 ya Carmel estaba haciendo entrenamiento para, uh, digamos, a, adecuarse a los nuevos métodos de trabajo que había en, um, en el periódico y su trabajo fue documentado como tal del 93 al año 95. So this means that from 1993 to 1995, her work was in fact credited, but she continued to work there for two more years. So uh, given how difficult it is to build bio biographical profiles, just keep in mind you should credit women so people in the future can <laughs> recreate timelines because this was very difficult. So, Although my proposal uh, for this grant only went so far until 1999, I like to finish this construction by um, showing Venezuela Magazine, which was also known as Revista Cancillería. And this she worked on and off from 86 to 99. It was in intermittent work. Uh, and she also worked there with her daughter, Estivalis Las Eras. Um, and here we can see how she remains to use white space as one of the main char visual characteristics of her work, balanced through the use of white space. Here we can see a spread on the left and on the right, we can see a biography page of an artist. So the results of all this research and all the things I found and I didn't found came to result in a timeline. So this might come off as something that's pretty basic, but knowing that there's absolutely nothing about this woman out there, uh, a timeline I thought would be the most digestible way to present uh, the work to anyone interested, not only researchers, but also students, whoever cares. So here you can see uh, all the columns that are in black font are things about her life that were happening. And all the things that are in magenta or that coral color are the things that happened regarding specifically the publications that I previously mentioned. And below, you see really, really small is that all the political context that was happening while she was living uh, that specific part of her life and that particular publication. So recreating this was... <laughs> very um, kept me on my toes. And another thing is that part of the work that I did was not only uh, do the timeline, but I also 
translated the timeline. So as I mentioned before, to me, uh, bringing this chair to have this conversation is not only to have this conversation within the US because I am in fact interested for people to quote Carmele and talk about Carmele and for her to be included in periodicals history, but also the huge gap that there is in my country itself. There's no information about Carmela in Spanish either, uh, besides one video and a few articles. So I took on the liberty of creating all of this content in both languages. And besides the timeline, I made a publication. So the publication was partly financed by the newspaper club in the UK. And by 10 by 10, I only made 100 copies. And with the publication, I wanted to portray uh, her life. So the smallest volume is her as a child, and the mid volume is her as an adult at Tipografia Vargas, and the last volume is her in the 90s when she was already super cute old lady. So um, besides the publication, uh, since there's only 100 copies, I wanted to create something that had a bigger impact and more reach for everyone. So I'm gonna close this, I created a website. So this website um, has different sections that you can explore. The first section where it says video, it's two videos. The first is the video, how I came to meet Carmele. If you click on that one, you can go to Vimeo. And the second one is actually the video itself of the publication that I made. So if you wanna see the materiality and the um, scale of the different volumes, you can see it here. The selection of images is based on gender perspective mostly and uh, the approach media had towards minorities in, in these different years. Then if you click on explore, you have the three volumes on ISU. So this means that people who can't, okay, this is not clicking. Well, it's supposed to click and you go inside. Reload. Oh no. Well, for people who can't, uh, for shipping purposes or money purposes, cannot have access to the printed publication, you can go inside of these links and read the publication, even zoom in like to the maximum. And also after I printed, I found even more information and some erratas and the digital versions are updated on the ISU page. So you can do that as well. Then I also helped build this Wikipedia page of Carmele. For now, it's only in Spanish, but it soon will be in English. And then finally, uh, I did uh, a little shop for people to be able to buy the publication. So I printed, um, I printed a hundred copies, and here's the publication. And my goal is to resignify the lack of printed media and the censorship in my country through a newspaper itself. And with the funds that I get from the newspaper, I plan to, with a lot of effort, do also a Kickstarter to make all of these visual research and facsimile that I've collected um, into a book. So just to close, I would like to thank some people because uh, as you know, this takes a village. I would like to thank Carmen Riera, Elina Perez Urbaneja, Araya Goitia Lizaola, Mikel Las Eras, Estiva Liz Las Eras, Oriana Nusi, my assistant who helped me with everything, Mariana Sumares, uh, Carlos Alfredo Marin, who's the historian who helped me collect and fact check everything that I did historically, Corey Rockcliffe, my husband, Samuel, who helped me uh, put together the website, 10 by 10, of course, for pushing forward this initiative and giving voice to the voiceless. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's it. Thank you.
I'm focusing on three women photographers um, in my presentation today, but I also want to um, just quickly, I just also want to give a brief overview of art and culture in uh, communist Romania and then talk about the association of artist photographers in Romania and photographia and I'll, I'll, I'll share why these um, are important and then go through um, these three photographers uh, before I come to a close. So compared to um, other Eastern European countries of the former Soviet bloc, Romanian photography is relatively rarely discussed in international overview. Um, yeah. you, you've got it in sort of a presenter mode, I think, where we're seeing oh, both the current that? and the next slide. Oh, you, so is it, uh, which one? I if you just wanted to go to, yeah. I thought I clicked that one, sorry, yeah. No, no so, worries. <laughs> um, so yeah, so so um, sorry. Um, so uh, I um, yeah. So so given the you know, so, uh, where was I now? Yeah. So so it's rarely discussed in in um, in in general overviews. And during my research, it was also you know definitely shown that it was hard to find um, certain um, certain information, and the archives are not as well developed um, uh, as as I would have liked them to be. Um, so the regime in Romania perceived artists and photographers as inherently dangerous and uh, by implementing the Soviet-backed socialist realism style or also known as Ceausescu realism um, as the dictator was called across the arts and cultural sector artists and photographers were compelled to adopt the, um, the idealistic aesthetic considered official art the aesthetic glorified the Romanian past and included homage art depicting the Ceausescu couple so this is just a couple of examples um, during that time by a well-known paint, Romanian painter, Dan Hatmanu, Hatmanu. Paradoxically, socialist realism was not strictly imposed from above, but there was an understanding of what was not to be photographed and many photographers and visual artists abandoned the artistic styles they had practiced during the interwar period, which was much more liberal. Um, not producing ideologically safe work was really risky. And here um, is a photographer who was active during those years, Dan Badescu, who I met last year when I first went um, to start this research. Um, and he, um, the image he, um, of, of this here on the right is basically one of these examples of this ideal, um, you know, socialist idealist. Um, instead of uh, pho taking photographs of the farmers while they were working, it was uh, taken in their Sunday, Sunday best and um, really uh, you know, showing that everything was fine and um, everyone was happy. So as long as this was portrayed, um, things could be published. I should also note this was published. That's why um, he took it that way. This was published in one of his books. Um, then Badesco confirmed um, during the conversation I had with him um, that you know, um, it was really difficult to publish work outside that realm. And he was working as an official photographer for the National Tourist Office during the communist years for which he photographed landscapes and historic buildings across Romania. Podesco revealed that in that the um, during that time he secretly basically used films and equipment provided by the office to practice his artistic photography which was different um, experimental in nature he used those pictures to enter the international salons of photographic art as a member of the association of artist photographers in romania other artists and photographers including hedy loeffler and clara spitzer who i'll be talking about later um, had a similar approach. So I'm not going to dwell much on Badescu, um, it was just an example. So although photography was practiced and encouraged as the benign form of expression, it was increasingly deprived of its artistic, social and documentary power and confined to the realm of amateurism. Stripping photography of its currency enabled the state to maintain control over it. Photograph, photographers had to be registered members of the regime's only officially endorsed and financially supported association um, of artist photographers. And their photographs were accepted because they seemingly had no social or political implications and sugar-coated social realities. So an ideology portraying what life was supposed to look like without documenting the harsh conditions of everyday life during the communist era. Thus, there was a seemingly clear demarcation of photography status. Artists were discouraged from using 
photography in their fine art practice, while photograph photographic art was only practiced by members of the association. So you couldn't almost be both. Um, So the association was first established in Bucharest in 1934. Members also issued their own magazine, Photographia, which you can see here. Um, and the first uh, iteration was between 1935 and 1941. Um, but both the association and the magazine were suspended during the war years. In 1956, the association was revived and Photographia continued the circulation from 68 until 89, so for another 20 years. Um, the current director of the um, association, um, Eugen Negrea, who I also met and spoke with last year, um, he really emphasized the magazine's important, um, importance by saying that it was the only source of information for the um, association's members uh, with respect to the evolution of worldwide photography. So the only source to really um, see other things as well, other things photography related. The regime endorsed the photographic movement by way of financially supporting the association. To receive the subsidy was not without problems, though, especially during the latter years of the regime when, um, as the director Negrea says, artists had to praise the achievements of the communist regime and were compelled to suspend all connections with Western, quote unquote, decadent art. Considering state sanctioned or official artists were discouraged from using photography during the communist era, it was ironic that one could not be an artist photographer without being a member of the association. So both um, a, a, the association's members and internationally renowned photographers presented their work in exhibitions that were organized by the association, which were the only exhibitions on art photography in the country. Photographers from other towns and cities across Romania traveled to the um, headquarter in Bucharest to meet other photographers and discuss the latest developments. The most um, significant achievement of the association was the organization of the biennial in International Photographic Art Salon of Romania. Um, and so here's just an example of, and I'll have a few, like one more example later, or a couple more. Um, so when you, when photographers sent their images uh, to, to, um, to be entered for one of these um, uh, uh, salons, um, they received those stamps at the, at the back. And so this is an example of a f woman photographer, that's why I've chosen it, um, that, that was entered in 1977, as the stamp says. Um, the first salon took place in 1957, so shortly after the revival of the, um, of the association. And the premise of all salons to date, um, so they, they are continuing um, to date, is to connect Romanian photography with European and international photography and photographers. So as mentioned earlier, the association published the magazine called Photographia, a quarterly publication. Um, it was the only source of information for um, the members in regard to the development of worldwide photography. And the magazine was mailed to FIAP um, uh, and to most of other national associations um, of photography in the world, press agencies and producers of photographic equipment. So the international exchange system for magazines, books and photographic albums was created while advertising orders and donations were obtained. And the cover of Photographia here is um, done, or was done by Hedy Leffler. At the time, in keeping with Communist Party rules, all Romanian publications were printed on the condition that the front page contained the portrait of the Communist Party leader, um, Ceausescu, as well as a poem dedicated to him. However, Photographia never contained images of Ceausescu on its covers, although the printing costs of the magazine were covered by the Ministry of Culture. In 1975, the Communist Party decided to stop printing cultural magazines that did not praise communist ideology. The dictator of Photographia at the time cleverly changed Photographia from being a magazine to being a bulletin, so, um, which meant it was not for sale at newspaper stands, thereby getting away uh, with not printing Ceausescu's portrait on the front cover or praising communist ideology in the magazine itself. Um, so although R Romania showed a promising start in terms of the emancipation of women through artistic and creative work, with some professional women photographers, um, especially studio photographers, working during the early uh, 20th century, 
uh, relatively few women um, in Romania were working as photographers before 1989. The records of the association, um, so which I've visited last year, also show a few photographs by women photographers. These are just a couple of uh, examples of, of women photographers, like of their work, but I have no clue. Um, I, I couldn't find any information on them, so I'm not going to talk about them. Um, paradoxically, the communist regime sought to represent women in visual propaganda as men's equal co worker so the intention was to showcase the state's commitment to gender equality and women's occupational status. But these were just the official narratives. Um, gender hierarchies and discrimination persisted in, um, in certain sectors, including the arts and, and culture. And so, you know, I, I, there's plenty of information on, on, on gender related things from Romania. And um, so the it, it was, they were not so much photographers, but maybe curators or um, critics um, at best, uh, but not photographers before 89 so much. Now, moving on to the three photographers. Um, so as one of the founding members of um, the association, Clara Spitzer was no stranger to the, um, was no stranger to the camera and owned one since she was 15, just three years before uh, her photographic career began. She was hired as a photography apprentice in her hometown, Timisoara, where she gained valuable experience as a studio portrait photographer, a skill that she would pursue throughout her career. Keen to learn more about photography, Spitzer moved to Bucharest, the capital, where she met Hedy Loeffler and became her photography assistant. Spitzer produced a broad portfolio of work throughout her career. Um, while she worked as a manager at the photography lab of the Ministry of Arts and Information. She also traveled the country far and wide for the ministry um, to basically photograph the development of cities and the workers on construction sites, demonstrating you know, um, her strong eye for composition. Given the pictures were taken for the ministry, they are very likely used um, for propaganda purposes. But after the revival of the association in 1956, um, Spitzer also used her photographs to participate in international photographic salons, such as the salons in Bordeaux and Warsaw in 1957. So these are two examples that were sent to Warsaw. In her last interview in 2012, she revealed that she was required to um, exhibit her photographs to show the development of the country. So even though um, she also submitted more artistic work, which I will show in a minute, I think. Um, Spitzer's early experience as a studio photographer made a lasting impression on her as she mostly preferred taking photographs of actors, especially in black and white. But she also had access to color films when they became available in Romania and just basically through her work. So this is just an example of her color photo photography. Um, more images by Spitzer. Um, the image here of the actor Gheorghe Denica on the left um, further depicts her creativity and desire for experimentation, just in terms of different exposures and so forth. Um, another example that stands out from her work she did from, um, from uh, compared to the work she did for the ministry, is the profile of a nude that, that was published in Photographia. So quite clearly, you know, we see like different, like her broad um, uh, uh, work and um, and, and some of it was, you know, for propaganda purposes, um, and some was a bit more liberal. Um, Spitzer's photography did not oppose the regime, but rather helped her pre um, preserve her own individual autonomy despite all the constraints on it. There was much to be gained from that strategy. It allowed Spitzer, just like Ben Bodescu, who I've talked to earlier about earlier. Um, and also, I didn't mention that, but Dan Bedesco, that's why it was important for me to meet him. He was Spitzer's um, student, and he's also the longest, um, the longest me member of the association who's still alive. He, was, he became a member in 1957. Um, and um, so, 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 so just like um, Bedesco, who worked for this um, National Tourism Office, as it was called then, um, Spitzer also had access to film and high quality equipment. Um, so that's what I mean by strategy. So uh, by, by, by being able to have access to all these things, she did what she did just so she can continue with her artistic work as well. Um, and, and because the equipment was not available widely for the general public, 
Um, so, uh, which was also part of the regime's way of controlling photography. So the equipment, film and so forth was not as widely available. Through her connection with the association, Spitzer also increased her chances of traveling abroad, um, which is just this a slide here. So this is um, um, just showing like, so this photo was taken in, in Buenos um, is it Buenos Aires? Oh, my Spanish, apologies. Um, and um, uh, of, of just, just her taking a photograph of one of these um, salons that was taking part there and where she was able to travel to. Um, and then uh, just here like this, um, what do you call it? Like a certificate basically um, from 67 also, um, um, I think it was a cell, um, it looks like it was a, um, in Germany because it's in German, but I can't, I don't know exactly where it was, but again, it says here on top, um, Spitzer. So she, she was able to travel through her work. Um, Hedy Loeffler, another founding member of the association, um, was a member of the um, association's steering group um, or steering committee and head of the exhibition commission who decided which photographs could enter international salons of photographic art. So she did have an important role there. Um, and therefore also decided which photographs could enter, um, which, yeah, which people had the opportunity to, which photographers had the opportunity to travel as well. Um, this was one of the few opportunities for Romanian artists, photographers to exhibit their photograph, um, photography or photographs internationally. Although it did not necessarily mean that they could travel. So it was um, not so easy to travel. Um, so sometimes, it's to, like most often, it meant that the images were sent, but not the people, the photographers. Um, they were not allowed uh, to attend the salons in person. Uh, while traveling nationally was permitted during the communist era, going abroad was not, bar in exceptional circumstances. So uh, my family, is, like, um, experienced it. Uh, you know, I wasn't born at the time, but like my my parents were traveling from Romania to. To, to Germany um, and had to leave my brother behind. So they had to leave um, quite often children behind um, to, as, as a guarantee that they would return, but families were not allowed to travel together into uh, to the West. Um, and so most approved photographs were posted to the salons and Loeffler's role um, at the association was therefore crucial as it afforded her um, greater chances to travel abroad to represent the association as well. Um, I don't know where I was with my slide. Oh yeah, so these are two examples just like of, of photographs, just where you can see more of these stamps. So one photograph, it was just one photograph basically, and that was like sent across um, over, over a few years. Um, and so the, you can, it's, it's got like here one name and then the different um, stamps uh, about the salads. Um, described as an outstanding photographer for the communist era who was awarded the highest title of the international Federation of um, Photographic Art, um, which is FIAP. Uh, Loeffler was largely interested in photographing landscapes and local tourist attractions, things um, um, like this, and produced 16 photographic albums during the communist era. In order to be published, the albums included several pages of homage pictures of the Ceausescu couple in color. So this is one of her books, um, Bucharest, and these are examples of the sort of images that needed to be published um, or be included in the publications to, in order to be published. And the book is, um, I've, I've got a copy, it was hard enough to get it, but it's, it's over a thousand pages. It's really, you know, um, a lot. So 20 doesn't seem so bad, uh, but it's still nonetheless Ceausescu, so wasn't that great. Um, for example, um, as I said, this, this um, this uh, a photo book starts with 20 of these images and then um, um, the, the rest of the image uh, of the album illustrates different cityscapes of the capital, interior details and statues. People feature rarely um, and if they do, um, it's mainly to promote the workforce or leisure activities. In that sense, Loeffler's images were safe from the regime's censorship. I mean, they, they, they ticked all the boxes of, of, of idealizing life. However, some of her pictures taken for Photographia um, or the ones that she's taken abroad illustrate her um, either artistic ability 
and interest in depicting everyday life without necessarily ideally idealizing it, which reveals her courage. So the, remember the, um, the cover of Photographia before that was much more artistic sort of exploration, it wasn't you know, necessarily great as such, but it's just that freedom that they were looking for. Um, whereas like here, you can see two images from a trip she's done um, to Paris. In 1998, Leffler was, uh, in 1980, sorry, Leffler was granted special permission to visit Paris and took several pictures documenting Parisian everyday life. Whether depicting a man asleep on a bench while seemingly waiting for the metro or a couple kissing in public uh, near the metro's exit, Leffler's pictures are striking um, as they convey a sense of realism and freedom of movement for anyone walking the streets of Paris, Leffler included. So perhaps not immediately clear, but the reason the, the images are striking in the context of Romanian communism is because they depict the kind of street scenes that were understood not to be photographed during the era, during the communist era in Romania. So life in Romania was under strict surveillance and controlled by the regime and the secret police. As a consequence, people kept their lives very private, and often not even trusting their own family members or neighbors. And kissing and sleeping, of course, were not forbidden, but it was not something to be done in public. Um, as an observer of social reality, Leffler moved through Paris anon anonymously, like a flaneur. This stands in stark contrast to Romanian society and its lack of freedom of movement during communism. There, Leffler's landscape photographs are, and, and arresting um, portraits were safe. But for just one moment, and in a rather subtle way, Photography enabled Leffler to resist the imposed aesthetic in, in a different social, cultural, and geographical context. Um, Jetta Britescu is uh, much more widely known. She was one of the few uh, women conceptual visual artists in Romania and worked across different media. So photography was not her, uh, the, her main um, medium. Um, including uh, film as well, actually, and, and, and sculpture and painting. Um, as a professional artist, she was not a member of the association um, and she based in Bucharest for most of her long artistic career that spanned over seven decades. Bratescu initially transformed part of her own apartment into her home studio um, to experiment with different art forms and themes, describing that the communist system did not allow for much. So hence she, 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 she took to her own uh, apartment to create um, her work. While traditional art forms like painting and sculpture dominated the Romanian art world during the communist era. So for instance, the sculptor Brancus or Brancusi um, started his career in Romania before uh, moving to France. Um, but more experimental neo-avant-garde um, neo art making was heavily censored. So Brotescu's own private studio was an intimate and productive space where she could develop as an artist and employ experimental techniques to explore the relationship between the material world and the abstract form through themes like gender, identity, and dematerialization. Brotescu was well connected with other artists, which helped her develop her artistic career. After she finished her studies, she worked as a, as a director, artistic director for a very widely known at the time um, magazine, um, which, which afforded her access to resources, including a, a, a proper studio as an, an external studio um, and all other opportunities to meet and collaborate with different national and international artists, such as the conceptual artist Ion Grigorescu. So she um, this also meant that she had a wider audience to show her work in her studio. Interestingly, her work towards white, uh, which consists of a sequence of nine black and white photographs, Bratesco transformed her private space of her art studio by gradually covering every object with layers of white paper and fabric until everything was concealed, including her own disappearance within the image. Through this work, Bratesco resisted the imposed version of reality Moreover, the metamorphosis of the studio could be interpreted as a transformation that dissolved the boundary between the private art space, which provided her with a place of freedom and refuge and everyday life during the communist era, which was very restricted. In doing so, the transformative artwork, the photographic sequence, is dialogical within the space. Describing herself as a rather isolated artist during the communist period towards white, 
not only enables a dialogue with the space, drawing on Ferry and Orton's idea of dialogic um, photog photography that facilitates encounters and human relations, towards White allowed Fratesco to explore a sense of self in relation to others through photography. This was central in the context of society in communist Romania. As Trond Gilbeck argues, Romanian society was not really a society, but rather an agglomeration of individuals who happened to live on the same territory, subject to the same regime, forced to seek a living in the economic setting in existence. Thus, the idea of photography as in dialogue with the studio meant that Brotescu's neo-avant-garde work was a strategy that enabled her to distinguish herself from the field of cultural politics and reject the socialist realism aesthetic of homage and propaganda art. At the same time, her work was in dialogue with other artists and collaborators. Um, so as I tried to illustrate through the works of Hedy Leffler, Clara Spitzer and, uh, and Jetta Brotescu in the context of Romanian communism, Photography can be used um, to develop alternative ways uh, to maintain hierarchies and power, as well as create new understandings of the world we live in. Although the communist regime asserted control over the camera, all three photographers and artists explored photography as a site to challenge the imposed classifications in subtle ways and take an oblique or political stance against the oppressive regime. Using the female gaze as a prison to the viewer to help the viewer understand the dynamics at stake. Photography enabled the three visual artists to position their photographic work as a tool for dialogical strategies. They created work from a different perspective. Since there were so few female photographers during the communist era, um, the focus on the female gaze helps produce a different and perhaps more nuanced perception through the tool of photography. Or put differently, the female gaze facilitates the shift towards an untold and unwritten her story. Photographs are a getaway into other stories and information. They bear traces that the, um, of the photographic event and their intertwining relationship and complicity with discourses of power, gender, and culture. Telling those stories is crucial, and in the context of communist Romania, they reveal many unwritten stories of everyday life under the totalitarian regime. Yet cultural activities are affected and restricted when artistic freedom disappears. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. These have been three just incredible presentations and this so exceeds any of, of I think, what we had imagined when we started this program. Uh, so uh, many, many thanks to, to all three of you. Uh, we are kind of just coming up on 2.30, um, and so uh, I want to be sensitive a little bit to, to folks' time. There were a couple questions that came in, uh, particularly for Yasmin, uh, but perhaps uh, we can take a couple minutes and, and uh, others can respond as well. Uh, particularly, I think about, uh, or initially a question from uh, Jenna Ahmed about sort of how um, you managed to obtain uh, some of the, or access to some of the images, and maybe in general, uh, given you know, the challenges you all alluded to um, about uh, sort of how, you know, how you tried to find, or, or the experience of going through archives, trying to uncover some of these amazing stories that you've, uh, you've been sharing with us. Yes, thank you, David. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Jenna, for the question um, and uh, for the encouraging words. Um, I Maybe I wanted to say a few words about the first question. So sure. the first question was about um, uh, why did Leroy Leroy use predominantly black and white film or, or photographs? And uh, I thought that this was an interesting question. I actually went further in asking how, how did she decide to use, or how, why did she decide to use black and white in, for some photographs and uh, color in others? 
And um, I mean, I, this, this, this needs more research to be able to answer this question, but I thought it would be interesting, you know, just to think about it. And for me, I, 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 I think maybe when she took the photograph, there was something that she wanted to show in color that of course uh, uh, adds or, or in a way, well, adds to the semantic of the photograph, to what it means, to you know, what she wants to convey through the photograph. As for the photographs, uh, all the photographs that I have used in this presentation are photographs that appear in uh, God Cried, the book that was authored by uh, Tony Clifton and Catherine Leroy and published by uh, Quartet. And of course, uh, Dominique, uh, who I can see here, I'm happy to see here, was instrumental to provide me with high resolution uh, photographs. Uh, and these are all owned by the Dotation uh, uh, Catherine Leroy. Um, and of course, this Dotation uh, um, uh, there are many photographs of uh, Cat, uh, Catherine in uh, at the dotation that are worthwhile uh, looking at. Um, what so the last one was yes. Uh, how was uh, Leroy's uh, work received by Western media outlets? And uh, so this is also another question that needs a lot of research. And a part of my research was to find out. Uh, how many of the photographs that were published in this book uh, were used uh, previously in the media. Um, now, I, uh, I need to do more research about this, but I believe that uh, the book, these photographs, the book has several stories. So there's a story that Clifton writes, but there's also another story or many stories that Catherine is trying to, uh, to convey through the photographs. And I'm, I'm not sure, I hope this came through when I was presenting her work. And so uh, I used uh, the story of um, Fadi, uh, the one that I mentioned towards the end of my presentation. Fadi was not mentioned in the text. So I believe that this is a story. This is kind of like a mise en abîme of a story that Le Roi wanted to have as part of the book. And the photographs are more than enough to tell the story, of course, with the captions uh, that would help us read uh, the story. I, I hope I answered most of the questions here. I'm sorry, I need to, I want to give some time to my colleagues as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, so maybe just building on the last part in, in terms of sort of this question about how some of this work might have been received uh, sort of more broadly, you know, both to, to Ushi and to uh, Faraday, uh, given that you mentioned some of how the, the work traveled or, or the artist traveled, can you comment at all about, you know, sort of any sense of, of the reception of some of this work? That you were presenting about in, you know, by the photography community or by the general public, sort of outside of their countries. Uh, Faraday, I don't know if you want to. I didn't understand the question too well. Can you repeat? So, so, so in terms of in, in your example, sort of as you mentioned, Carmelo, for example, working in Spain and otherwise, was there a notion of kind of her visibility or how? There might have been a response to her work uh, from you know, people in Spain or elsewhere that might have seen the, the work produced when she was credited. So it's actually very ironic because although she has a strong, very strong connection, even her figure today with the vast community and the community in general in Spain, uh, her career was entirely developed in Venezuela. So she is a reference of Venezuelan journalism and um, graphic design and photo montage. Um, I think it's kind of like, well, like most things in Venezuela, uh, a secret kept in oral tradition. So I think that the work that we're trying to do, that I'm trying to do is you know, create these sources for people to remember her work and to recognize what was done. And particularly uh, her relationship with Spain was only those two years. She was only in San Sebastián when she was a kid. Then she moved to France for a couple of years. That's where she learned French. And then when she moved to Venezuela, one of the things that she used to say is that, yo soy la más caraqueña, which is I'm, I'm the most like Venezuelan here <laughs> <laughs> with her sick thick 
accent, she was like, I'm the most Venezuelan. So her sense of belonging also was key in the hybrid, in the hybrid nature of the work. And in her later years, when she began to have um, Alzheimer related issues, she moved in 2000, in the late 2016, I wanna say. She moved first to Argentina with her daughter, who I saw in the chat. Um, and uh, then she moved to Madrid. And that's where the last records of um, interviews done to her were and where she passed. So there was, all, there was always a huge uh, bond to the Basque community, but her sense of belonging to the country is what made the work kind of like a, like a global hybrid um, phenomenon. <laughs> and Anushi, I mean, again, you mentioned some of the work being at least a few images sort of going to exhibitions and elsewhere, at least in Europe. Was there a notion of kind of how this work would have been viewed, you know, across the European community? Um, it's it's definitely a, a, a great question um, to which I don't really have the answer um, in the sense that um, what I've seen so far is that the record keeping um, in Romania was very bad. Um, the archive that I have visited, um, the Association of Artist Photographers. Um, I mean, it was it was it's actually in a really bad condition compared to what we would think of an archive um, and it's not digitalized and it's um, I don't even know what will happen to it. And um, and so it was, you know, what, it's almost like when you find something, you just have to to, to treasure it for for what it is kind of thing. And, um, you know, before you start getting too excited to start finding traces to to other things sort of things. But um, that said, I am, you know, I've been successful to get more funding now. So this was a starting point. And, you know, I'm flying now actually to a different part in Romania. I'm flying to Timisoara, where Spitzer was from, where um where where a uh, heady uh, leffler was from as well and there is an exhibition currently um it started today uh, that i would like to visit and in a museum but that is also around um uh, uh, romanian photography so it's 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 more of a starting point now and hopefully like um i can fill you in um as, as i go away you know but I, I, yeah i do want to publish more on this as well but it's just it's quite frustrating um actually like uh to 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 have so little or to to be quite creative and imaginative in terms of how to get the um the images and how to get some more information um and lastly what i want to say about that is um that one thing that i need to re uh, remind myself is not to compare um in terms of not to compare this research to other research so when i when i say like the archives are just so in bad condition i'm i'm, I'm training myself to just appreciate that there are archives and not and not look at you know um, at how well they could be I mean I'm talking about a, um, a a situation where the photographs were basically in boxes pretty much kept outside for a decade and just with the tarpaulin kind of thing so you know so so a lot of photographs had to be thrown away and so they still have a few but or a few thousand but nothing compared to what they could have had over the whole history of the of the association and um it's just yeah it's just a, a different approach to to keeping these records i guess as a as, you know art and culture and maybe that's just indicative of how it was seen during the communist years and so um my my interest is very much so in developing helping to develop some sort of cultural heritage and um you know i'll be i'll be i'll be going back to romania later this year with funding that i received more significant funding that um, I want to create exhibitions where I invite the public to donate their photographs, uh, not donate, but to, to share their photographs. And just, just to, 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 to start this heritage thing that we are so used to, so familiar in the West, but it's um, not so much the case. Um, and also in terms of color photography, I was just thinking, I was reading about it some, quite some time ago um, in relation to Henri Cartier-Bresson, who never wanted, never liked taking photograph, uh, color photographs, although they existed at the time. And I was, uh, you know, a lot of it was said that um, it was just not 
the thing to do to take color for, uh, photography for documentary images. And I remember like uh, people like, um, who was it, like uh, uh, Philip de Corsa or um, they were the first ones kind of thing, or what's his name, Eggleston or so. They just, they just really like branched out a bit more on color photography, but within a different context. And so, um, yeah, but it's not my, it's not a answer, it's just a answer maybe, not my, you know, uh, but maybe a suggestion why um, those images were taken in black and white, um, even though color existed, but just for the, maybe to be more powerful, which they were. were. Well, thank, thank you again. Uh, again, these have been amazing presentations. Just as we wrap up, do either any of you have questions for each other or uh, I can sort of stop the recording and let folks unmute and we can just sort of say hello to each other. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Oh, I just have a comment and I wanted to have it recorded so that I'm really <laughs> <laughs> honored to be sharing space with such talented women as Ushi and Yasmin. Uh, as a young pseudo scholar myself, um, I I feel um, I have been really nurtured by seeing the the process of their work and sharing just by sharing the space with them. So that's I, it. <laughs> I second that. That's beautifully said. I couldn't have said it better. But yeah, I, I very much um, thank you so much to, to everyone from, from everyone attending today, 10 by 10 specifically, for awarding the, the grants to us. Um, it's just been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, David, for organizing this evening. I mean, you know, like this was also a lot of work. Uh, different correspondences, email correspondences and all. And thank you for the public uh, also to uh, attend our presentations. And uh, it was really a pleasure sharing um, this screen with uh, my colleagues tonight and speaking about women and photography, which is, as you can see, uh, a, a, a something that we need to put a lot more effort in and uh, yeah, and that it's important. And you've shown how much there is to, to discover and share. And so again, thank you very much. Thank you.